Have you been looking for a way to stay focused on your goals and grow your MSP? Accountability groups from Rocket MSP can help. We offer weekly accountability sessions that meet online with a group of your peers. Your success begins with accountability. Go to www.rocketmsp.io to join your accountability group today. All right, looks like we're live. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome right to another installment of MSP webinars. Uh, Jamie, are you able to hear me? She unmuted herself. I'm going to mute her again. So, <laughs> so, so Jamie's having technical difficulties. So we we unfortunately need to keep moving. Uh, forward and go live because we started like five or six minutes late. Uh, today we will hopefully be joined by Jamie. Uh, we also have Josh and Zach that will be joining us. And uh, I've got some other people that are, are willing to hop in as well if there are questions that these folks cannot answer. I believe this is Jamie calling me here. Hi, Jamie. Is that you? Sure is. All right. I've got you on speaker. And uh, we're just going to make this happen. We're, we're live on the webinar. <laughs> we can see your video. Perfect. Yeah. You look great. Um, <laughs> so, all right. Uh, it, it won't be the, the highest of definition quality audio, but we're, we're going to make it work for Jamie. And I'm just looking. Is, is Zach in here? And I'm just not seeing him because the list of people is huge today. There's 150 people registered for today's webinar, and uh, that's, that's a very exciting number for me. Um, all right, so let's, let's get started. Um, Jamie, are you able to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so I have been in sales for uh, nearly 20 years. I've worked for, uh, as a regional trainer, uh, sales trainer for Microsoft. I've worked for companies like Toshiba, at and uh, as well as Mind Matrix. Uh, about two years ago, I started in with, uh, with, with Mind Matrix, and, um, and I started working in the MSP Advantage program. And growing up as a, uh, as a child in my father's computer, uh, computer repair shop, I, I found that it was, it was the vertical that I really enjoyed. I, I really found myself uh, connected to this particular industry. And so uh, when I decided to part ways with with uh, my matrix, I decided that what the industry uh, needed wasn't another marketing expert or product. What it, what it really needed was somebody to teach the smaller MSP, the startup MSP, really how to uh, how to do the sales fundamentals, how to you know pick up the phone and, and change the conversation, you know, uh, break away from me. Hi, my name is so and so, and I'm calling about blah blah blah. And really, really connect with the prospect and teach you different ways to to disrupt that cold call. So uh, that's that's kind of what brought me here today. It's been a really great journey, and I'm really excited to uh, to be here. So I appreciate you you have me on today, Steve. Absolutely. All right, thank you, um, Josh. How about you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh... I have a pretty wide history. I've been working in IT my whole life. Actually, my first contract job when I was uh, 16 years old, I installed a Nobel network. Um, so love IT, eat, breathe, technology, always have. I've worked for companies like uh, Priceline.com, uh, seen as wholesalers as a Fortune 500 company uh, that I did uh, a lot of stuff for. I have a history I started in development and software uh, creation back in the early days of Windows 1 which I don't know many people remember, um, but uh, I've worked for, uh, I, I was the uh, head architect for the city of Allentown surveillance project, which is here in PA. Um, and then in 2010, I opened an MSP late 2010, early 2011, and have been doing that ever since. Good for you, man. All right. Um, I still don't see Zach. I think Zach got stuck doing some work, so we'll just move on without him. It's okay. 
Um, so I'm, I'm going to start with Jamie. And, and I think my first question is going to be, how do you start marketing your MSP? Well, um, that's a great question. In fact, um, you need to stop marketing. <laughs> um, marketing is marketing is a 40,000 foot view. Okay. When you're just starting out, you, you really need to focus on business development. This is, this is what is, think about, think about sales as two parts. There is the product and then there is you, the service. But when you're first starting out, your managed service provider is not just your product, it is your service and you are your product. And so when you're marketing yourself as your product, you're going to find that to work smart and not necessarily hard is going to be to identify as many, uh, as many partnerships as you can within the community and leverage those partnerships in order to be your eyes and your ears within the community. Because the more partnerships that you can, that you can build, the more eyes and ears that you're going to have out there in the community. So you really want to think about the folks that are also in your customers' offices. You want to think about the, the different buildings. Having some technical difficulties, can't hear Jamie. Steve, you got Jamie muted and yourself. Well, you know, I could speak for a while. Uh, I, I can't hear you, Steve. Can't hear you, Steve. Some great technical difficulties. Apparently, um, I'm not even sure what that the, the question was on marketing, but that's really Jamie's area. Hey, Jamie, pick up on your phone. I installed the app on my iPhone, and that worked best. Can you hear me? Shake your head, yes. Oh wow. Hey, Steve's back. This makes absolutely there, no sense. There, Steve, we can hear you. Okay, while we're waiting, why doesn't somebody ask a question in the chat and I'll do my best to answer? Uh, been an MSP for about uh, six years now, so I'm sure that... Uh, I could answer some questions and I've worked as an expert in the field for a pretty long time. So shoot away, give me something. How many endpoints do we have? Uh, we're holding steady between about five and 600 right now. That's all? Yep. <laughs> okay, so you can hear me now. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, apparently, so my computer just went wonky. That wasn't even the webinar tool my computer for whatever reason decided to uh switch the sound device so now i'm using my headphones sorry about that um okay let's let's continue with josh since you guys are asking him questions sure i'm i'm patching as we go so rmm tool uh we've been using kaseya for a, a higher time now and uh 
we use it in a hybrid mode because of my development background and because uh, this topic is on process and uh, procedures. Uh, we primarily use the core components of Kaseya, and I've rewritten uh, a bunch of it to work more specifically for us. So there's a lot of ties between our RMM tool and our PSA tool, which is Autotask, and I've written a lot of those interfaces myself. So in a large way, I've written my own, if you've heard of a product called IT Glue, I've written my own IT Glue on steroids, which allows us uh, to uh, do a lot of things that put us ahead of the competition in our area. Uh, for instance, we write our own executive summaries, which are very unique. Uh, in addition, um, we have a lot of automation in uh, how we catalog and maintain customers' environments uh, from a documentation perspective, like network devices and endpoints and things like that, that are all combined. Uh, which allow me to very quickly at any time not only assess somebody's environment, but tell you what it's worth in dollars and cents and where things are in a replacement value. A lot of things everybody wants, but it seems like no RMM tool out there can seem to get it right. We've just used Kasey as our base point and kind of built all the back end stuff we needed that we didn't have. Uh, how many techs, four or five endpoints? Uh, right now, our company is uh, at uh, five people, uh, four engineers on a daily basis, but about three people handle the day to day. So we're split up uh, pretty cleanly. You know, as you think about organizing your structure, we have someone who is our knock uh, person who takes care of the day to day um, automated end of our RMM tool. So for instance, things like patching and uh, auditing of the devices and such. And then we have a help desk uh, person who's responsible for the day-to-day -day intake of tickets, responding to them and dealing with them. And then we have an ops manager who kind of oversees both of those roles and kind of pulls it all together and deals with all the level two type uh, tasks that come up. Can you still hear me? Uh, I'm, I'm hearing you, Josh. I'm muted trying to help okay. Jamie troubleshoot while you were doing your thing. Sorry to confuse gotcha. people. So she should uh, probably just download the phone on her iPhone real quick, download the app and run it from there. That's And that's my next recommendation to try, yeah. That'll be the quickest way to get her. Oh, we hear her. You're, you're hearing her through my phone. Oh, okay. Okay, any other questions? Oh, kind of keep things rolling, use the time efficiently for people. I don't see any there. Josh, could you expand on what you mean by constructing such? Okay. So um, if you aren't doing this, this is something you should be doing, and Jamie would hound you about this which would be you should have uh, a regular QBRs with your customers. So quarterly business reviews, if you don't know what that word is. The goal really to a large degree is that that's not only your chance to uh, always talk about your liabilities and risks for the customer, but to upsell them to other products and offerings that you have. So our executive summaries are constructed in such a way. And when you, when you ask about the word constructed, meaning I've actually written them in uh, SQL Report Writer myself. They actually draw out of the strengths of both what our ticketing system is doing and what Kaseya can see and is pulling together, draws that data together and presents it in a fashion to the customer that's fairly unique. I didn't like anything on the market. Nothing was presenting information in a C-level format to our customer base. So I developed my own report, which really brings the data together, not only from a what customers have, but what the help desk is doing, but also how the dollars and cents are actually driving and working for the customer. Uh, let's see, tools that you would use to visualize map endpoint servers, let's see. Well, uh, is yeah, Visio for that? Visio is a way, we have automated tools that use Visio to drive them, but if you're looking for other tools, there are things like Avic. Avic is a pretty popular tool right now for uh, auditing networks and pulling the content, yes. Uh, all of our stuff is done, uh, AUVIC is spelled A-U-V-I-K. Um, we do all of that ourselves. Uh, Kaseya also has a built-in tool for that. I will tell you, it doesn't meet our needs uh, as an MSP. I like, 
as you get to know me, I am a very uh, OCD person. I like everything to have a certain look and a feel to it, not only from a marketing perspective, but that shows that you have very defined, very detail-oriented process. So all of the data that we have for our network maps and stuff is developed through our tools and brought out through a very standard looking interface. So our customers always see us through the light of being organized, structured, and obviously very important in what we do for work detail oriented. Uh, if a 20 endpoint client says yes to your stack, what is your approximate time from start to finish for onboarding? So we have a very detailed onboarding process. Uh, we use Autotask as our main TSA tool. And our entire project for, uh, for onboarding a customer is approximately 140 tasks. Uh, from the moment the customer joins on board, we actually let them into that project so that they can actually see everything we have to do and how we have to do it. Because there's a lot yeah. involved in actually bringing a client on board. But I want to show them from the very start, since we do charge a fee for setup, we want to show them from the very start our level of attention to detail and uh, how we structure things. So our entire onboarding process is logged and available to the customer, and we say to the average customer that it takes a month. It really doesn't matter if they're a 20-person customer or if they're a 100-account uh, uh, customer. It takes the same amount of time because of the way our process works. And we use and, a lot of automation to deliver that. And um, I, I know I'm, I, I'm supposed to be paying attention, but <laughs> I, I was helping Jamie, Jamie out. So what RMM are you using? Uh, we are using Kaseya. Okay. I, I like you a lot more already. <laughs> um, and what PSA are you using? Uh, we are using Autotask. All right. And you're, in my you're couple a of winner in my book. Out there for six years and working with pretty much everything, I have found that in the PSA line, I've used ConnectWise. I've developed backend for ConnectWise, so I have quite a history with that. Uh, I've looked at Kaseya's, uh, oh, I forget the name of it now, B... BMS. Yeah, thank you, BMS. In project management stuff, it's just weak. It, it just doesn't compare mm -hmm. to Autotask. Autotask, in my opinion, is one of the best uh, PSA tools out there to date. And having a development background, it kind of gives me a different insight to the way GUI interface design looks and the way uh, the rollouts of uh, product development are. Uh, Autotask by far represents a really good structured approach to both uh, troubleshooting and rolling their product out. Awesome. I agree with the bowel movement syndrome. <laughs> now, are you using something like uh, MSP Assist to get Kaseya and Autotask working together? Nope. I have built my own infrastructures. And because of my development background, again, all of the linkage between those products is custom and developed by us in-house. Oh, wow. Now, have you have you considered selling that or making it available to others? Uh, we have not. And, and part of that is that's what makes us proprietary right now, right? So in our competitive industry, mm -hmm. obviously, you need to have a USP, speaking to Jamie's uh, area a little bit, but you need to have a unique selling proposition. What makes us unique from beginning to end, uh, I mean, I really do not think you will find anybody in our area that sells like we do. Uh, you know, from the first time you meet us until you're really involved with us, we, I have, as the owner of the company, put a ton of work into making our model and our offering unique. So that when we go to customers and say, yeah, we're another MSP, but they see how our data connects, how our information uh, drives what they're doing, it is our uniqueness. It's what, it's what makes us unique. Awesome. Now, guys, can you start putting the, the questions into the ask a question section? Um, it, it will make things easier and, and more organized. Um, okay. So let me look yeah, and see how if have you gotten to say an auto task to talk. Um, lack yeah, of that party one. connectors. Well, the reason I chose Kaseya and why I like it so much, one of the reasons is we use an on-premise version of it. Why does that matter? As a developer, they use standard technologies like SQL. So SQL is, is a tool where I can go into the back end and actually control the database, make changes to it. Both products, by the way, if you didn't realize, have APIs or application programming interfaces, Autotask and Kaseya do that allow me to actually interface with those products at a deep level and actually drive data in and out of both of those products. 
And then uh, Nunya, Nunya, I assume their last name is Business, uh, said that LabTech also uses SQL. Yep, LabTech does, uh, and ConnectWise does ha- did have an on-premise. I, I don't know that they do anymore. They've pretty much, I think, gone completely cloud. Kaseya does still have on-premise, if that's what right. you're saying. Yeah, okay. Um, I haven't touched base so, with them in a while. Yeah, um, and Central, ConnectWise Automate, and Kaseya VSA can all offer on-prem solutions to people still to this day. Awesome. So, and that's kind so, of key. if you want to have control over your products, the key is you need to pick something that allows you the ability to control it when you need to. Okay. Now, um, are you using Office 365 across all of your clients? Uh, yes, no. We're not using it across all, but Office 365 is a primary offering in the Office suite for us. But obviously, it's dependent on some of the client preferences. If, if they don't want to use that, you really can't force them uh, into your product line. Now, for the people that you've got on auto, uh, Office 365, are you using um, multi-factor authentication? Or are you enforcing? Um, we don't enforce that uh, as of today. Uh, we kind of, uh, it's kind of, we desire it highly and it goes on the risk analysis for our customers, but it isn't enforced. Okay. And do you have any other measures in place to protect the, uh, the system from data loss or anything like that? Well, it pretty much it's specifically from the office 365 standpoint or wider. Uh, office 365. So yeah. My opinion personally on the data loss, which I'm assuming we're talking about now disaster recovery versus someone uh, hacking or breaching their account is, that is why you turn your client to Microsoft. That is in their liability responsibilities. So in being efficient, I don't want to double up liabilities. Basically, the client understands that I'm reselling another vendor's product and I can't be accountable for uh, mechanisms I can't control. And I set those ex- expectations up very early with the client so that I don't put myself in a position of being responsible for things I can't control. But but wouldn't it, wouldn't it also be true to say that as their, let's call you the CIO of mm-hmm. that client, even if it's just a VCIO, um, shouldn't it be your responsibility to make sure that all of their stuff is safe and secure? And I'm not saying to make it your liability. I'm saying, for example, um, what, what's that uh, product that, that Datto has? Isn't it like backup of fire or something like that okay. where it backs up office 365? Yep. And there are products like that. Here's the problem that I find, and this may be different across the U S as I've talked to different MSPs. There are a variety of, of different, like I just found out in talking to a couple of buddies I have in Texas that they're charging anywhere from $25 to $30 an account for email. Where I live, that's never going to happen. My market bears a whole different dollar value. So in a lot of cases, although those solutions exist and a lot of that is available and I do discuss those exposure points with the customer, trying to sell that here, you got to know your target market. My market doesn't bear it. They don't buy it. They're not willing to spend the money on those kinds of things. We do and, educate, but at the end of the day, a lot of them won't commit. And with that said, so, so you know, you, you said that um, you, you can't justify charging, you know, $25, $30 per mailbox, but why does the client have to see an individual price? Why can't you just say, I charge $200 per user and all of this stuff is included. Oh, you can definitely do that, except for that's very uncompetitive in this market. The problem is you can only sell your product. You got to know your market and you can only sell your product in, to what the market will bear. And I found that varies greatly. I, I'm, two, I'm about two hours from New York City. And what they can charge in New York City per user is extremely different than what I can charge. Uh, I live in a very, I live in an area where the market just won't bear it. They, they won't pay for it. My competitors are charging way less. And so even with all the education effort I make, I can only drive my prices up so high. Otherwise people just don't buy. Gotcha. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Let me go to the next question here. Um, with your homegrown IT glue, we'll call it. Did you, did you build it all the way from the ground up? 
Um, you know, I've, I've looked, so this person's looked into doing that for their business and it seems like quite a project. Um, it is quite a project. Uh, but I've been developing, uh, software and things since, you know, actually for companies and corporations since 18, uh, since the age of 18, I was a Microsoft architect. I have a lot of experience in development. So it being an undertaking. So the first question is, did it start with something else? No. It started with an idea and a lot of time in front of Visio and drawing up some concepts. But the actual development and rolling it out is more about about tricks and tips and and having a development background and knowing how to attack something. Um, so, no, I mean, I've been here six years and I kind of have it rolled in and it is kind of working, but it is always a work in progress, of course. Wonderful. And uh, let me go to the next question here. I can hear everybody, by the way. Oh, there she is. Yay. I can hear and I can see and I can be heard. This is exciting. Um, the next question is from Errol. The question is both. <laughs> the question is what? The question is both, period. So <laughs> I, th I think... Uh, he, I, I don't know. Uh, the next question is, what do you recommend for MSPs? My answer to that, that is yes. Yes. <laughs> I like it. Uh, what do you recommend for MSPs that don't have a strong SQL programming skill as far as the RMM tools are concerned? Uh, if they'd like to build their own integration? Well, I mentioned or name dropped a tool that I really think is doing well for people who don't have those capabilities. IT Glue is actually a fairly decent product, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I, the only reason I really haven't committed to it is because I already invented that wheel. So why pay for something in my company that I have? That's very reasonable. Uh, next question. Before Jamie was cut off... <laughs> <laughs> uh, she was talking about marketing the MSP business and saying, don't market it. Can you explain why? Yes, I would love to. I believe that marketing is, is, is a 40,000 40, foot view. And the smaller MSP is typically in the, in the stage where they need business development. They need prospecting. Marketing is... There are two parts to your product. There's the service, and then there's the product. And when you are in the, in the startup phases of a business, you are your product. And so unless you're going to split off and become 10 people all at the same time to go out and do your sales for you, it's all about working smarter and not harder. So I firmly believe that the best way for an MSP to grow or any small business for that matter, to successfully build and grow their business from the startup stages is through strategic partnerships. And what I mean by that is you want to think about the different companies that are in your client's offices. So if you're if you're targeting, you know, uh, veterinary hospitals and and small, uh, you know, small um medical practices, you want to think about the different vendors that are out there that they're writing checks to. So you want to think about, okay, so they're having their paper shredded or, you know, who's their banker? Um, who is their landlord? Who, you know, who all are they writing and who are all they writing checks to? Because that's, those are your eyes and ears in your prospect's office to build relationships with those folks. Those are going to be your mini salespeople, if you will, like your copier reps. Uh, I love copy reps. That's one of my favorite strategic partnerships because these guys actually know your tech. They know they're actually working within the network that you want to manage. And they understand data vulnerabilities. They understand if there's an IT person on site. They understand if that person is overloaded or, uh, you know, uh, or is, you know, outnumbered with work versus, uh, you know, uh, you know, capability and hours in the day. So, <laughs> You know what? That's absolutely correct, uh, Dom. But the thing is, is that there are 
some companies out there that are corporate owned, um, you know, that I, that I'm a big fan of, um, Toshiba is one of my favorites. If you can get with Toshiba corporate, they don't have any interest in it, but there are a lot of smaller companies out there that do want to dabble in that. So you're absolutely right. Um, However, there it's further than just outside, uh, you know, the copiers co companies like uh, your paper shredding companies, uh, your water cooler companies. So these are all people that have relationships with your vendors or with your with your prospects that can ultimately look around and say, hey, I know a guy who, who has really great soft or uh, really great service rates that might be able to, uh, to, get, to help you out with that problem that you're having. Um, as well as they already had that relationship built, that rapport built. So when it comes down to marketing, everybody wants to sell marketing and they want to sell this, this price tag that's just far, it's far higher than the average smaller MSP. <clears throat> uh, can everybody hear me? Cause yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it's usually, it's usually a price tag that's much higher than the smaller MSP can really afford, um, for what, they really need. Um, so I believe in business development at the, at the, at the fundamental stages, when you get to a growth stage where you're ready to really start pushing techs and you really want to double your business, that's when marketing really starts to, you know, starts to, uh, to, to be a, um, more of an asset. Awesome. Now, um, I, I want to, but Jamie, Hey, Dom, that's your advantage. Uh, that's how I sell. I don't look at that as a disadvantage at all. Yep, you're right. There is a there's a shop out there selling copiers and doing network. How could how good can they really be at both? We specialize in worrying about networks and security. I'm not a copier specialist. I don't claim to be, and I don't focus my attention or my techniques on that. So my unique selling proposition is my 100% dedication and focus in my company is to ensure that your networks are safe and running properly. And we'll hire a copier company to worry about the copiers. So you want to find, use that as a leverage, not as a, a negative. All right. So, so real quick, I want to try and, and rein it in because there was a lot of chaos at the beginning. And I apologize, everybody. I do. Growing pains for, for MSP webinars as I, uh, as I make changes to try and make everything better. <laughs> <laughs> one one step forward and two steps back. So um, I just want to recap. We're joined by by Jamie. Thank you so much, Jamie. I'm so glad things are working for you. Jamie uh, is a marketing and sales. I don't want to call her an expert because who really is an expert, right? But but she is here as our expert to to discuss marketing and sales. And and Josh is here to discuss. Uh, we're we're hoping to talk some about onboarding and service delivery. Is is a couple things I'd really like to tackle with you. So, um, let me let me try and start from from the top. I want to I want to take like a like a top down approach for all of this. So when it when it comes to, I'm trying to unfocus now. There we go. All right. When it comes to um, hmm. when it comes to customer acquisition, we need to come up with with kind of the we we need to figure out how to get the customer. And I would say that the first step in getting a new customer should uh, should essentially be prospecting. So. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask both of you. I'll, I'll start with, with Jamie, ladies first. Jamie, how should an MSP handle prospecting, finding those potential leads? Well, really focus on what you're good at. If you know tech, talk about tech. Marketing isn't just about building the best commercial for your product or the best packaging for your product. Marketing and prospect you. And in, if you're in the MSP industry, you are selling yourself as an expert. And so how does one prove that they're an expert in anything until they have exposure? You can be the best at 
the thing that you do, but if nobody knows that you're out there, you're not the best because nobody knows you're out there. So it's important to, to start looking at ways to talk about yourself, to start talking about, you know, talking about what it is that you do, the value that you offer your clients and your customers. Um, and what's out there, what they need to think about, because the buyer's, it's no longer the sales funnel, it's what's called the buyer's journey, and, it, and it's three stages. The first stage is the awareness stage, and that's where the customer realizes that they have a problem. The second part is the consideration phase, and that's where they say, okay, I have a problem, now how do I solve that problem? And then the decision phase is the final phase. And that is when they say, okay, I have this problem. Here's how I'm going to fix it. And here's who I'm going to have fix it for me. So when, you're, when, you, when you get a flat tire, you say, oh, I got a flat. Well, okay, so what do I got to do? I got to get a new tire. Well, who am I going to buy it from? And that's your decision. And the same thing goes with the managed services world. But the problem is, is by the time the customer picks up the phone and calls you, They've already kind of made a decision. They know that they have a problem. They know how they want to fix it. Now they're just trying to figure out who they want to fix it. But here's the trick with managed services. It's your job, especially as a smaller MSP, to get the customer who doesn't realize they have a problem to realize that there's a problem. And that's through building trust and awareness around the industry, its landscapes, its problems, its vulnerabilities, and it's ever changing in the ever changing world of IT and, and making them go, oh man, I, I could be in deep doo doo if I don't get this fixed. And you're the person that brought it to their attention and said, hey, are you familiar that this is happening? Are you familiar that that is happening? And they go, man, no, I didn't. You've already become trusted. You've already you've already become um, somebody that they that they that they can they they that that is already kind of built a solution around them because you've told them here's this problem and you never tried to sell them anything. So <clears throat> that is that's the key to the smaller MSP marketing themselves is to become an expert at your industry and not be a salesperson because you're never going to outsell a salesperson. There are a million salespeople out there who will outsell even me and people that have been doing this twice as long as me. So don't try to outsmart the expert in the sales world. Stick with what you're good at and you're good at technology, talk about it. Tell the customer what they need to know. You guys spend every day telling your friends and your family what they need to know in this watered down, easy to consume version of what you know every day. You have to actually work to, 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 to tell people this stuff in the, in the long way. You know, it, it, you have to, to do it technically, it's like work for you now. It comes naturally to you now to, to dumb it down and make it easier for the average person to understand. Leverage that practice. You've had a lot of time doing it and you can, you can really really, really make that work for you. And that's what you need to stick with, what you're good at. Because you can't you can't learn how to do something else if this is what you're good at. So stick with what you're good at and tell these folks what they need to know and how the landscape is changing around them and make them aware that they have a problem because they're automatically going to come to you to solve it, even if you're not the lowest price in town. And that's the key. I lost you, Steve. You're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> this day's gonna get better. This day's gonna get better. <laughs> there was a there was a quote I wanted to share by Rand Fishkin. It's uh, the S. He was the CEO and founder of SEO Moz. He said back in 2015, the best way to sell something don't actually sell anything. Earn the awareness, the respect, and trust of those who might buy. And that's what I believe. So, Now, uh, concerning the prospecting process, cold calling. <laughs> There's a reason uh, they call it cold. Yeah. 
Um, is cold calling with sending out emails talking about what you offer a good process to use? Is that still a thing? No, it's a terrible thing to do. Now, I'm sure <laughs> I'm going to name drop right now. I'm sure Carrie over at Managed Sales Pros would beg to differ. But I, I think there's something to be said. And, you know, there's there's many ways to skin a cat, right? Yes. So I, it's it's OK that that people have more than one way to, to accomplish the same thing. Now, um, so so you don't you don't recommend cold calling at all then? Well, no, I don't. And it's because what what to you, Steve, is is a cold call. Give me the quick little uh, give me the, the quick biology of the cold call. Uh, OK, I go to yellowpages.com. Right. I look for plumbers in my zip code. Gotcha. And I start calling them and saying, hi there. I'm Steve with Taylor IT Group. Are you the person in charge of your IT? Because <laughs> because that's I mean because that's what it is right that's that's what everyone does for cold calling that that I could uh, that I could think of off the top of my head and I'm sure that that there are many people that do cold calling and they do it successfully cold and it call. sounds nothing like what I just did. <laughs> that's absolutely right. The cold call is only cold if you take that approach. Mm -hmm. Now. Carrie with MSP, uh, the, the MSP yeah, sales pros. sales pros. Yes. Her name says it all sales pros. Yes. That is what she is. She is a sales pro. You yes. are not. Don't try to be something you're not. Don't talk about, don't try to sell when you pick up the phone because that's not what you're good at. Customers can smell blood in the water a mile away. Now, mm. If there's a lack of confidence, if there's a if there's a lack of confidence, they translate that into honesty. A lack of honesty is what they see a lack of confidence as. They feel a customer will smell that lack of confidence and think that you're being less than honest with them. But what they don't realize is that you're just outside of your comfort zone. So that, that is so true in so many ways when it comes to cold calling. So that's why I say don't don't cold call. You can pick up the phone and you can talk to a stranger, but why does it have to be cold? Okay. What first, first thing I'm going to say to you is the same thing I've told sales trainees for decades. What, what do we have in front of us right now? A computer, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty easy to see who, who handles the technology. If you do your homework, it takes two minutes of research to ask for the person that you want to speak to. And if that customer isn't worth two minutes of your time, is it really, are, are, are you really ready for the customer? Hmm. Go on LinkedIn, figure out who the office manager is before you pick up the phone. It takes a minute and it will pay for itself in spades. Yes. It's not about qual quantity. It's about quality and customers can sense that a mile away. Now, when you pick up the phone, you don't ask for the person who's in charge of technology. You say, Hey, I'm Jamie with, you know, uh, with, with, you know, the, uh, you know, um, with, uh, the Taylor IT group is Sue around. Well, well, may I ask who's calling? Oh yeah, yeah. No problem. It's Jamie with Taylor IT group. I sent her a really important email about a, a cybersecurity threat that I wanted to make sure she was aware of because it really affects your industry. And then you start talking high level technology with that, with that person. And that, 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 um, that, you know, that, um, uh, that receptionist eyes are going to glaze over because she doesn't understand tech. She's going to get you off the phone as quickly as she can. She's going to give you to who you need to speak to because she's going to think this person isn't a salesperson. Her job is to weed out salespeople. But isn't that fear mongering? No, it's all about how you approach it. You have to talk about what, that is what it is that's going on. I mean, you can look at it as fear mongering or you could look at it as this is real. This is what's going on. 500,000 routers in the consumer market were hacked in the last 24 hours and your data is being looked at right now. That's, that could be fear mongering. 
if you want to look at it that way and you want to you want to try to stay behind that curtain of reality and pretend that the the tough little world doesn't exist or you can say hey look let me tell you what it is what it does and how it impacts you take the fear out of it explain yourself explain what it is but that receptionist you should never take a sales approach ever okay now um do you, do you have anything you'd like to add, Josh? Uh, I'll be honest. Uh, I think we have the sales process pretty well figured out. We have the service delivery pretty well figured out. We suck at marketing. I suck at marketing. And I'm going to be honest. I hire Jamie. Whoop, I guess the camera would be going the other way. Uh, I hire Jamie to uh, take care of my, my uh, prospecting and marketing. It's not something that I have spent the time in my company to figure out and understand. And she has a good handle on it. So we use her to help us get there. Uh, sales is a whole different thing. I do have a strategy. We do have very detailed processes around how we sell. Once we have somebody that is interested in hearing from us. Cool. All right. Now, um, so you, you said that you're bad at marketing and that's what you're hiring Jamie to do. So, so does that mean Jamie's going to like chamber of commerces and, networking events and join a BNI for you? No, uh, what Jamie is handling is strategy. So okay. uh, where I lack wisdom and background is specifically on what techniques and processes work. I can go to chamber events. I can do those things. The thing I lack is does that work or doesn't that work? What are the measures of what makes a marketing technique successful? R remember, we're in business, guys, right? So none of mm -hmm. us want to blow our time doing something that doesn't yield in dollars and cents. And so it is smart for me to hire somebody who has a background in that and can help me understand where the business and, and uh, money goes and comes from before I get involved in those things. I've tried all those things like everybody else, the mailers. I, you know, have a background with Robin Robbins uh, to a large degree, though. A lot of the measures of my success were limited. And I think some of it has to do with my marketplace and some of those scenarios. And I really needed someone who could give me focused, individualized attention on what is the best techniques to, to work around some of the problems that I'm having in my area. And Jamie helps a lot with that. Okay. Um, all right. Let's see. More Q&A questions. Given that many clients or prospective clients don't know tech, uh, or maybe they do know tech jargon, but they don't understand the lingo and words and phrasing. As a technical consultant, is it good to be jargonless when approaching new clients? Are you going first on that, Jamie? Or is that for me? I, um, I, I'll tell you right off the, the, the bat. Um, my approach and part of our name and who we re represent is the word integrity. That's where it starts, right? And so when we think about integrity, using tech jargon and things like that in a lot of cases, what's that about? What I see at the end of the day in a lot of people is one of two things. One, they just don't know common speak. Or number two, they think that barraging people with a bunch of no-nonsense words and making themselves sound smart is going to get them to work. I disagree with that philosophy wholeheartedly. That's how I operate. <laughs> Does it get you anywhere? <laughs> Um, Look at me now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, my philosophy in operating is is really, I mean, that is part of the art, right? Is taking something that is extremely complicated and difficult to understand, and and turning it into everyday language, right? Who was it that said that? Einstein or someone said, you know, that's the beauty of taking something complicated and explaining it simply. You know that that really is the goal. So go ahead, Jamie, take that one away. I can see you itching. Oh, no. I, I, you, you have a customer that you've been working with for the past 20 years. Tell us about that relationship with that person. And when you make a recommendation to that client, what their take is on that and why? Well, our relationship, uh, we have a couple that are actually that old, but uh, I know the one you're thinking of is pretty much I can call the shots because it's a 20 year relationship and they're, they're a $30 million a year uh, relationship. Uh, why do I get to call the shots? Because uh, the relationship I have is I've proven myself time and time and time again to think first of their business 
and what I would do in their shoes because of the size of them, but also what the right solution is. And because I always have come to the correct uh, analysis, they trust me. I have a deep level of trust where I don't really have to blow every decision by them. In a lot of cases, I'm allowed to make those decisions for them. Uh, hmm. Yet knowing when to do that and when not to do that is key to keeping that relationship at that level. Excellent. Let's see here. As far as Jamie's ideas for finding members in the community to be your eyes and ears, what are your thoughts on utilizing local chambers for the eyes and ears? Local chambers are local chambers are hit and miss depending on where you are. In certain neighborhoods, they are very well known organizations where everybody knows each other very well. In other in other cities, it's it's different because everybody goes to a chamber meeting expecting anybody who walks up to them uh, is going to try to sell them something. They are, it's, it's a cesspool, and I hate to say that, of insurance agents and life oh, insurance. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. And, so, and, and, and financial planners, and it's like, it's, like, it's, like, it's like you see them coming this way, and you want to go that way <laughs> as quickly as possible. Because... Uh, I, I want to say um, that is my exact definition of a chamber of commerce it is it is a room where you can go to once a month for lunch uh to to have a bunch of uh financial advisors insurance guys and other salespeople pitch stuff to you and not care what you're there trying to pitch to them and and i i don't feel like the chamber of commerce is a very good place for you to 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 go and try and build those relationships, not for our industry. If, if you're a, a, you know, Geico insurance rep or, or state farm or what, well, I don't care, whatever. Uh, it's a great place for you because everybody's typically pretty okay with getting a quote so they can get some cheaper insurance. Sure. Cause, but that's also because, and, and I can say this because, uh, my my company office was inside an insurance agency for three years, four years, four years. Um, people don't understand insurance, so they just want the cheapest insurance out there. But when they sit down with a good insurance agent, then they're like, oh, I didn't realize I need to have this type of coverage. I didn't realize that, you know, there's a difference between uh, my basement flooding from rain and my basement flooding from a septic issue and, you know, stuff like that. So when, when it comes to that type of stuff, we need to be educating our potential clients just as well as the insurance agent is educating his potential clients. Well, because once they understand the value in what they could be paying for, they are likely going to be more interested and willing to spend more money to get that better service. Well, so the question that we asked was, was whether or not the chamber of commerce is a good place to oh, it's meet, not. It's a terrible place. <laughs> to meet uh, other people as your eyes and ears. And to prospect, it's a terrible place. But if you want to meet hungry salespeople who are underpaid and overworked and you want them to be a part of your referral program, that's a great place to network. Those people are starving for an opportunity to make extra money. Um, like whenever I worked in sales with some other companies, I would love to have met Josh and, uh, and, and been a part of his referral program. Man, I would have made money hand over fist. It would have been great because he has a really great referral program. And if he could sit down and talk to somebody that doesn't have the right resources and tools and pretty much has to try to build their own, their own pirate ship and sell this product for some company that underpays them and, under, you know, and doesn't prepare them with the right tools and resources, absolutely. This is the, a great place. This is a hunter that ultimately is the kind of person that you want out there looking for computers that are that they're having problems or frustrated employees looking at you know 
that are complaining about something or, you know, the network or something. These are really great people to network with, but don't do it at a chamber. Get that handful of business cards and have conversations with these guys. Look at them on LinkedIn. If you see on LinkedIn that that person has been with the company for maybe six months, talk to them. Heck, you might actually get to know your next salesperson. If that person's treated so poorly by their, their current, their current employer, but yet they're making hand over fist and referral money with you, that might be the first salesperson you hire. They already know your product. They already know your value statement. And they're already looking for a job. They're looking for somebody who's willing to pay them better. So these hungry, See, I didn't even think about it like that. Yeah, these hungry, under underutilized, underpaid, underprepared salespeople are going to be one of the most valuable resources that you can find. So yes, connecting with those people are invaluable, but be careful because you you do want to keep an eye out for qualifying. So when you meet somebody in the insurance world has been doing it for six months, who's in your in your prospect's office, and he you know he wants to tell you about this person or that person, ask him questions about that client or that prospect. Start training them on qualifying questions so that you're not chasing your tail on crappy referrals because. Your time is valuable too. You, that's a billable resource. You can't waste. Excellent. And I didn't even think about it as utilizing the other people there to sell for you. Yes. That's that's an excellent idea. That's your now, strategic partnerships. Um, now let's see here. Looking at the next question in the list. Uh, what I have done is actually ask for an email address from the first call. Then I send the email. After that, I follow up to find out if they got the email and if they're interested in what is being offered. What do you think about that process? I think the better answer is, the best Change answer the is, how is it working? Change the email. If it's not working for you, change the email. Don't talk about you and your product. Talk about things that they need to know about, things that are going to raise awareness that they have a problem. And that problem is, is that their tech isn't as secure as they may think it is. That is pushing a prospect into the buyer's journey and being the only player in that game. You're basically becoming their seller's advocate or their buyer's advocate. You're saying, here's this problem. Are you familiar with it? Let me tell you what this is. Hey, you're not ready to, you, you don't want to buy. I'm not calling to sell. I just want to make sure you're aware of what this problem is and how it impacts you. Let me know if you have any questions and walk away. They will always have questions. Mm -hmm. They always will. They want to know what does that mean? And when they come back to you to find out what that means, they trust you. That is a demonstration of trust that any time that there's a problem, out there that you want to make them aware of, they can pick up the phone. You can pick up the phone and ask for them directly. And they're going to be happy to hear from you because you're not calling to sell them. anything. Okay. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I want to bounce over to service. Um, so, so let's assume, you know, you've gone through the whole marketing and sales process. How, how, so, see, so you, you get a customer, Josh, a new customer, they, they sign your agreement, and now what? Well, for us, there it really isn't a now what. It's just the continuation of our process. Um, if you don't have a map for your business, if you don't have a step one, two, three that you follow, then ability to be successful is going to be limited. Why? Because, you know, all the way back to the invention of the assembly line by Henry Ford, all I hear that's arguable, you know, what he knew was a process that's repeatable is more profitable than one that you can't. So the goal in delivering good service is creating solid, repeatable process. And that starts with sales. So for us, when we win a customer, it's not like, oh, gosh, we have a customer. It's they're just continuing down our path of exactly where we go. The next step after signing the contract is we build an onboarding project. Then the onboarding project drops into the successful roles that need to follow through. Each of them are given tasks and tickets to follow through, and each of them deliver. 
So really the key to a lot of what makes service delivery successful, in my opinion, is well-designed process, taking the time to really and know what your steps are and down. Ah, hang on one second here. No problem. Okay. That was a good answer, though. Now, I see somebody asked, can Kaseya BMS their PSA be on-prem? And the answer to that, no. Moving on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> There's guys. <laughs> uh, let's see. Jamie, what do you think of calling a company and getting an appointment with the right person to discuss your services? I I like the idea of calling a company and getting an appointment with the right person to do a network audit, to do a security audit, to let them know that everything is up to tip-top shape. Call them and just say, hey, I'd like to sit down with you and do an audit with you. Well, everything's fine. Hey, wouldn't you like the peace of mind of being sure? Let's do an audit. It doesn't cost anything, and you'll get to you'll get to say everything's great, and you you've done your job. Somebody in your position wants to make sure you're safe, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. What's it cost? Well, maybe when it's free. Who knows? knows? Yeah, it's maybe free. Our process well. Oh, I just in general, period. I think that you should always tell the customer that everything that they're doing is right to get that appointment. Hey, you know what, Mr. Customer, there is you are not doing anything wrong. You're absolutely right. But don't you just want to make sure that you have your T's crossed and your I's dotted? Why don't we do an audit and just make sure? And plus it'll let you know where you where you are today based on the landscape of technology. Things are changing. That's what I think you should do. Don't talk about your services until you've earned the right to. And you can only earn the right to by telling them that they've done it right at least two or three times. Nobody wants you to tell them to call them up and say, hey, nice to meet you. We're doing it. So Errol, um, Errol put something interesting. So Errol said he likes to ask them what their Office 365 secure score is. And they'll give you a blank stare. Errol, like a month ago, I gave you a blank stare. I didn't realize Office 365 added that new score feature. Um, you have them log in to securestore.microsoft.com. Their score is going to be low, probably in the teens, 20s, or maybe 30s. Uh, they should, in his eyes, be in the 200s. What what gets you in the 200s? Making sure everybody has 2FA and, and all this other security stuff. Obviously, it's a secure store uh, score, so it's all security-based. But gonna... if they have admin rights, then their score is probably pretty low because you shouldn't have a user with admin rights, and everybody knows that. Yeah. Now, Josh... Um, do you require a customer to purchase new hardware for standardization? Depends. So as Jamie talked about the, the audit, that is a requirement during our sales process. Again, we have a process even for sales down to the key. So during that initial audit, part of the goal is not only to, to establish pain uh, in the selling process, but to also for us understand the engagement. Uh, understanding engagement is really important. So sometimes uh, if the customer's environment is really not at the shape, then a project is the first step in, in, in there and hardware placement is necessary. Sometimes it is not. That's reasonable. Well, and some people, some people call it an audit. Some people call it a security assessment. So, you know, it goes by many different names, but it's not, it's not a terrible way to at least to tell to at least get them to take a look at it because how can they absolutely be sure they're the CFO or they're the CEO they trust somebody to do their IT but it's also their job to question if they're trusting the right people and these guys do it pretty regularly so you know 
A lot of folks find that the assessment, the audit, is the best way to get in the door, just to tell them that everything that they're doing is perfectly fine. It's great. Yeah, ours is called a network assessment, by the way. I saw somebody <laughs> talked about the word audit. Yeah, I, I could see how the word audit could be a little scary. It does sound very official. Security evaluation. Now, um, Josh, how effective has Jamie been for your company? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, in all fairness, uh, it's a new relationship. Uh, Jamie, what is it, maybe two months? A little under, yes. Yes. So it would be unfair of me at this time uh, to make an evaluation based on that. And why do I say that? Uh, I like her as a person. I think she has a lot of value. But the reality is I am a numbers guy at the end of the day, and the numbers aren't in. But it's unfair to ask for numbers yet. Uh, so you realize marketing is a work in progress. It takes time. Uh, it is an art uh, as well as a science. And so uh, we already know kind of going into this relationship that it's going to take a while to have a turn on results. She has definitely offered value in as far as uh, she provided us a whole bunch of leads. She's very good at uncovering um, contact information and those kind of things. So she's been very valuable in that area. Uh, she's also offered some strategy and direction already within that month or two. But actually, you know, probably business owner to business owner from, from that relativeness, it's very new. It's very new. So I wouldn't, you know, being honest, I don't have the numbers yet. Well, I mean, we, we also we we also have you know a seventeen percent open rate on emails, so that's, oh, that's definitely good. yes, that's definitely the sort of thing you want to look for early on in a marketing relationship of any kind. You you may not see results right away, but it's the smaller benchmarks. What 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 is you know where are you at with the with the the micro steps, and that's that's how you establish whether or not a relationship is working. For you, we can't hear you, Steve. You're on mute, buddy. He loves that mute button. He does. I do. I do because reasons. Um, okay, so processes and procedures. How do you effectively handle monthly changes of device or user counts, uh, especially as they stray from their original MSA? Uh, I'm going to go backwards before I go forward with that question. One. We reject a lot of clients, and I'll just say that right up front. And what do I mean by that exactly? Meaning when we're in our sales process, part of our qualifications is looking for a certain type of person. And, and you know what? I can't give you the magical formula to that because part of that is based on who you are and what you're looking for in relationship and the type of client that you want. And that varies for each person. I will tell you in our process in answering that question is we don't have a lot of that. And the reason is, is our sales process is well engineered um, to avoid those kinds of clients. I'm not, I, I don't have to have every client that comes to the door. I'm not looking to close every piece of business that crosses my desk because we all know that it is more than just a monthly cost or a monthly uh, value that's coming in. There are long-term cost relationship and, and they need to be weighed and evaluated in each customer you take on. Excellent. So how do you handle when from month to month, what, what, what do you do? Okay. So you, you bring on a new client, 50 people next month, they've got 56. Do you just start billing them for 56? Do you have to sign uh, okay, yeah. a subcontract? Once a month. So basically our system, Autotask, uh, handles prorating just fine. So when a new, uh, they understand upfront when the relationship is being formed, our contract covers all of that. When a new device shows up in the network, they understand right up front in our relationship, it is required to be on a manned service contract. We don't accept devices in an environment that aren't. Why? Because security is a main part of what we supply. Everybody knows you can't be just throwing things in an environment uh, and be safe. So yes, the second it shows up, an agent is added. And uh, as a result, that also through our back end uh, automation throws it into the contract and then they're prorated from that day forward. Perfect. So 
and I'm I'm not asking you for to, you to know, post the contract or anything, but essentially it sounds like your MSA has it so that um if if the number of devices changes, you don't have to do any revisions or appendices or anything like that. You just you just build them for active and it's probably a high watermark for the month, I assume. So whatever like if if they go up to fifty six on the tenth and they go down to fifty three on the twentieth, they're getting billed for fifty six, I assume. I'll be honest with you, Steve. Uh, we don't actually have that scenario. I don't really okay. have clients that are going I have clients who are going up absolutely as their businesses grow, but I do not have that kind of variances in my month to month with customers. Uh, I wouldn't accept that. Basically, that wouldn't make a good customer for me. Someone who brings on 10 computers one month and then removes them the next month, that would be extremely difficult to manage effectively. Uh, Josh, well, I'm sorry. Do you do mobile device management? Yes. But they have to be company-owned assets. So you won't do employee-owned or, or whatever, individual-owned MDM? Nope. Uh, I can speak pretty highly to that being a security risk. We stick them into a guest VLAN only, and they we do not uh, adhere to the BYOD mentality. I, I do see a lot of problems with that and have plenty of war stories of how that doesn't work as well as the small business world would like it to. From a security what, what, what are your feelings on BYOB? Um, I absolutely recommend that. I got some work to reserve back here. I mean, there you go. Now, how do you determine when to fire a client? And this could go for both of you. Jamie, I'm going to let you start on that one because I need to uh, uh, get some power into my phone here. I've got a good answer for this too. <laughs> I'll let you go first, Steve. So, so my honest answer is, um, I don't work with people I don't like to work with. Profitability is not always my my number one thing. I've you know I've I've worked with some some really annoying, rude, you know whatever whatever term you want to use for 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 this type of of customer. If if you've got a customer that's high maintenance and you and you just don't want to work with them, if you can afford to fire them, then fire them. Well, that's my that's my way of thinking okay. anyway. How can you afford that? The way that I look at that particular topic is that if you cannot deliver the level of the the level of experience that they deserve, in the sense that whenever whenever you have a relationship with somebody, if you feel like what they want from you, you can't, you can't meet. You can't commit to that. And so it's, it's time for you to part ways. You cannot sit here and try to kid yourself and say that this high maintenance pain in the neck customer is ever going to change. And you're not going to run your texts in circles to get that person happy. And so that relationship is going to start off on a bad foot. And I guarantee you it's going to end in a bad foot. It's going to end on some nasty review somewhere, on some board somewhere with a big black mark. And you tried to do everything that you could, but that vindictive little you-know-what decided that they didn't like their life that day and wanted to post a nasty thing about your business. And that's not fair to you because you may have been over backwards six different ways from Sunday to please that client. At the end of the day, it's a pretty simple conversation. Steve... I think you're a great guy. I think your company's headed for great things, but I just don't feel like I can, I can properly serve you to the level of service that you need. And I apologize. However, I think that you might be served with a better, with a different MSP. Would you like that? I make see you some recommendations. And Wait, put, re recommend some big company somewhere that, <laughs> That you know has 30, 30 texts that are all doing 12 different things and they're just a number to them. And let so, them do it. So, Not Jamie, are, are you breaking up with me? <laughs> if I can't make you happy, Steve, you should break up with me. 
There you go. And, and you know, you, you made a really, really good point. You said if you can't provide them that level of service, uh, and, and I think a lot of the time when you've got a pain in the neck client, it's like I, I can't provide them the level of service they think they expect, yes. or I don't want to provide them the level matter. of service. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't. And, and at that point. Their reality. And their reality right. is you suck as a provider to them. And that's but what they're no, gonna put, even though you don't suck in reality and your key performance indicators say that you're on point, your T's are crossed, your I's are done, you've given them the best service that they've ever seen. Their reality, their perspective is that you're underserving them and that is their reality. And that's what they're going to go to review boards with. And that's what you need to protect yourself from. But let's, let's go the opposite direction. Um, and, and I actually know of a, a real life situation where this is true. You have a client that loves working with you, but you just can't stand them as a human being. Uh, for whatever reason, they the annoy politics you. politics out of this, Steve. Hey, this isn't politics. This is simply <laughs> they annoy you. They, they'll, you know, something. and, and. And the, the, you know, I, so, so I have, I have a, a colleague that they had a client that I think, I think a lot of this was their own fault um, because they didn't set those, those expectations of don't send me text messages and phone calls at nine or 10 o'clock at night uh, to, to talk about our work, you know, that, that type of stuff. So, you know, shame, shame on what? Just texting me at ten o'clock last night. I'm like, that's off limits. Um, <laughs> it oh, was I- for him, in in his eyes, it was off limits, and he was annoyed that he's getting texts at ten o'clock at night, and they're they're expecting responses at ten o'clock at night. Let me let me so, answer this on on because this involves service delivery. At the end of the day, it starts there. Mm-hmm. In that example. Um, a, we can always go backwards and learn from our mistakes, right? Only fools continue to repeat their mistakes and doing it again, right? So first thing we need to look at is how do I prevent upfront from this scenario happening again? That's the first question you need to answer yourself. And uh, secondly, after you really looked at that and you made sure your upfront processes um, have are well set to avoid clients like that in the future – Dealing with clients like that comes from good contracts, right? I have my contract is almost 40 pages long and I do go through that with all of my clients. Why? It details those kinds of things that allow me to address scenarios like um, you can't call me at 10 o'clock at night. You know, uh, we have a process for that, right? And it's listed in the contract that you call the help desk line, not me personally, if there's an issue. Uh, And really that's about boundaries in life and learning healthily how to deal with people and being able to say no and saying this is inappropriate and I need to take control of this, right? You're a consultant. You need to be competent and you need to be a good communicator. When those incidents happen, you need to stand firmly on what you know is the truth and the best way to address it. So, so when you determine to either fire a client or part ways or whatever, or uh, decide that the prospect that you've been courting, it's, it's not going to be a good relationship. How, how, do you, uh, how do you break up with them? What's that speech sound like? And in a way that they're, they're not offended, I assume. It depends on if they need to be offended or not, right? As long as you've done <laughs> the way you say it. I have an example of a client like that. We'll start with that one. I had a client that we... We brought on board, oh, this is a while ago. They've been gone for quite a while now. But um, for no reason at all, um, because they had unreasonable expectations and were buying the cheapest service we had, but wanted, thought that we were offering at the highest level, they would get upset and they would call our, our help desk yelling and screaming. And I literally got on the phone with that person after an incident and I said, this is not going to work. Uh, this is not going to work. And I, we are really not interested in this relationship as a result of your behavior. I'm treating them like a child now because that's how they're behaving. Um, and, uh, I don't think this is going to work. So actually what I did for that client to keep the, um, to keep the, uh, 
the emotion down, I guess is the word I'm looking for. They were new. They'd only been there a month. I gave him his money back, said, go away. You know, didn't say it that way, but I basically said, it's not going to work. And, and to show you uh, genuinely that, uh, I, you know, hopefully you find what you're looking for. We'll exchange your money. We'll give you your money back, money back guarantee. And uh, they went on their way. Now, in a more difficult scenario, Steve, uh, um, it, it kind of you're talking about something more difficult than there. Um, it really varies. You know, becoming a master of language and having a silver tongue are an important part of our jobs as owners. And knowing what to say in the moment and how to analyze it with somebody, it's not easy. And I can't give you a one size answer fits all. It depends on the client. And because communication is a two way street, right? We all learn this if we've been married. Uh, you need to learn how the other person perceives what it is you're going to say and what it is. And you need to learn the language you're using and how they're going to interpret what it is that you're that you're saying. Right. Okay. Hey, I, 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 re I remember to unmute before I started speaking this time. You guys should be proud of me. Um, why are you using a BlackBerry, Jamie? That's my question. I like keyboards. Uh, <laughs> I have an iPhone hey, as Jamie, well. You're rocking the we, retro. We were dogging on phones. I figured, you know, the work phone, I went with one of these, but uh, my personal is an iPhone, but I figured, you know, you were going to make fun of it. So I figured, why not uh, announce that little tidbit? <laughs> All right. Um, beyond a gut feeling, how do you support the decision to fire a client? Is it is it when you look at profitability, or is it look at when you look at uh, technician happiness? Or I mean, what what would what would your reasons be to part ways? I personally, um, I think you hit on the head the very first one, which is profitability. Right? If you don't know the numbers of your business, then why are you a business owner? You know, a major part of what you do every day is managing the numbers. You're in business, obviously, because you enjoy what you do. But number two, if you're an owner, to make sure that your company is profitable and being successful. So the very first thing is to know those numbers and know whether a client is profitable or not. Other than that, yes, I have in my company, I have standards by which I like to be treated, right? Any human being should be treated. One of those is, yep, you're not going to call and yell at my staff. That's inappropriate. If we if there's not a good reason and then that's inappropriate. And as the owner, not I'm not expecting my staff to do this. I will call and address that directly, you know, in defense of my employee. You know, no one's going to be treated that way. Nobody uh, deserves that. We don't do that to our clients and we won't be treated that way the same way. You know what? You need yeah. to be ready to deal with that when the time comes. That's a tough one. It really is. Well, and from a marketing standpoint, firing a customer is a two pronged approach. You have to look at. First, the profitability of it, but also you have to look at the return on the investment of that relationship because there is the soft cost that goes with the uh, the stress, the burnout on your employees, the stress on yourself, your day to day, your family, your friends, you know, the the time it the the amount of time it infringes on your personal life. So the as well as the after relationship, the post breakup, the the, uh, you know, the going on the I hate get guy dot com and posting nasty reviews about how, you know, ABCIT treated me poorly. You also have to look at, at the whole picture. Profitability isn't just the dollars and cents from your nine to five. It's how does it impact your 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 kid, the time with your kids, your wife, your your family? Um, does it call you on 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 Christmas Eve? Like, you know. That those things are those moments you can't ever take back the the moments that are stolen from you that you get to spend with your family. Nobody says, I wish I spent more time at work. They look back at their life and they say, man, I wish I would have spent more time with my kids. And so there is a certain amount of a personal take care of you that you have to make sure that you're doing when it comes to these relationships. And it all starts with first taking in an acid. That'll tell you if it's your gut. And then secondly, asking yourself, in a perfect world, if I could prove, if I could give this customer everything that it, they want to be happy, what would that be? And then once you realize either A, that doesn't exist, fire the customer, 
or B, that it does exist and you can't meet those needs because you'd be stretching yourself beyond the point where your other customers would be sacrificed, break up with that customer. These are all very important things to consider. It isn't just as easy as, as the, the right here, right now, this, this invoice and what that means and how much it costs. It's, it's about the whole picture. It's the quality of your life. That's the whole reason why you went into business for yourself. Because you didn't want somebody telling you how to do, you know, where to do it, when to do it, and how to do it, and what time to do it. If that customer's infringing on your on your liberty and your 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 ability to 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 make that you know, your authority to do that for yourself, then maybe it's time to part ways. But that goes back to I just don't like them. And they're fired. <laughs> now, um, what what would you say, Josh, to a break fix client? Uh, and I don't even know if you have break fix clients anymore. No. Um, did you ever? Um, yes. Once upon a yesteryear before I was a managed service provider and was a consultant, I did. Okay, good. So you had that transition period at one point. Mm -hmm. So how did you get a break fix client to switch to managed services? Because I guess my assumption because it's their assumption is it's going to cost them a lot more because now they've got that fixed bill every month of, Oh, I got to pay this guy two grand and again, nothing even broke last month. What am I paying him for? Well, I, I think there, that's a loaded question. I, you, I, you fire the ones that won't convert. That's my personal opinion. And we did um, in the ones that would convert. Um, the way we converted them was by demonstrating how the problems that they were having and the risk they're taking. And I think we, let's start here. We all know this, the industry's changing, right? We have a lot more breaches. We have a lot more security. People are buying new technology now at a bit and much faster rate than they used to because of the, advancement. as a result, if we look at the paradigm shift that we're experiencing today, it kind of even leads towards the idea of what managed services is entire world is moving to that model. So in the people that I could change, uh, really, they understood that paradigm shift. I was able to communicate that and get them to move into that paradigm shift. The ones that couldn't, we fired. You know what? And yes, I understand the pain of what I'm saying. Listen, I, I, I've been there. I've been there where like, well, is that really the smartest move? But when I look at the dollars and cents and the aggravation those people were causing because of the hourly model, I did what I had to do. And it did profit me better and made my people happier and allowed me to focus on the customers that were willing to pay me to do it right. Now, I, I would say this. Don't just start firing customers. Uh, I agree with Errol. He says, don't just start firing them. Make sure you're fully comfortable with the managed ones for your income first. And at that point, they try to sell them uh to a hung, hungry to buy, uh, hung, hungry, hungry to buy break fix shop. Here, here would be my recommendation. Um, I like to take the, uh, uh, he's, he, I think he's in here as Johnny Walker. I like to take the Johnny Walker approach and no, that doesn't mean go pour a glass. Um, I like, uh, I, I like to say, okay. I know my rate was 120 an hour. Um, I'd love for you to sign up with this managed services platform and, and it'll be, you know, X dollars per user and we don't have to get into that. And if, if you're not interested, that's fine. I would love to continue supporting you, but because my main focus is shifting um, I've, I've made some changes in my business. My new hourly rate is $400 and, uh, let them fire themselves <laughs> or, or, or fire me. I mean, it depends on how you, how you think about it. But, um, you know, if, if they don't, if, if they don't want to, to pay you the monthly, then, you know, 
charge them the the idiot tax and and make the the rate higher for hourly service. Except for the only problem with that for me, Steve, is say they take that. If you're really getting to a solid delivery model that's based on MSP, now you have a headache on the sidelines. Assuming they don't take that and they're a smart person, now you've offended somebody that's going to go spread around to the rest of the community what they really think about your services. You really do have to craft a method of firing people in scenarios that you mm. do that don't alienate your crowd and that put you as a premier, well-accomplished uh, uh, MSP. So it is how you say things. It's how you craft the language when you're breaking up a relationship. Not any different with a girlfriend or anything else. It's, it's how you approach that end point that demonstrates the maturity of you as a person and your company. It's very important that when you're doing a breakup with a customer, and I'll change from the word fire to breakup, that you use the right language and that you, you mean it in such a way that it's an amicable ending. You mean the it's not you, it's me. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Well, that's what that's what I was I was uh, kind of referring to whenever I was talking about how I cannot serve you to the level of service that you deserve. Translation is you think you deserve, but you're incredibly unreasonable and a little bit eh, crazy. But you don't have to say that part, but they feel that they deserve that. You cannot meet it. Tell them it's not you. It's me. We can't serve you to the level of service that you deserve. Sorry, it's not you. Now, it's not. Just they just you trying know. to trying to keep their best interests in mind. It's not what you say; it's how you deliver it. Just like and that's next, by the way. So long after that customer is gone, your words, your your way of approaching things will still be spread around. So you want to make sure that the way that you do that uh, matches your character and the way that you want your company presented into the future. Perfect. Um, we have time for just a couple more questions. Um, now, Errol asked, and and before before you guys answer, uh, Errol asked, "What is your opinion on lower cost marketing firms like Pronto or something similar to Pronto Marketing, or maybe a thousand dollars a month or so for some Google results?" Any experience? Now, I I feel like. I feel like what Errol is trying to do is have you guys justify the expense he just signed on for because Errol just signed up for Pronto. Um, full disclosure, I just signed up for Pronto too, and I'm really excited. When you really asked yet. me about it, and I said it's a great idea when you, when you asked me about it for you. Mm -hmm. I told you the ups and downs of it, and it all depends on where you are with your business. If you're a, you know, if you're a smaller MSP that, that, that needs to make sales, you don't have a solid customer base and you can't pay your bills and you cannot commit to, you know, uh, to, you know, your, your monthly expenditures, you don't need marketing. You need business development. You need to work on prospecting. You need clients now. But if you're in a position where you have, your monthly expenditures covered, you have a marketing budget, you have a goal that you want to meet and a clear understanding of how you want to get there, then you're ready for marketing. The, it isn't just about whether or not you have X amount of employees. And Josh is a clear you know, uh, uh, example of that. It isn't about how many employees you have, it's about where you are. If your bills are covered, your expenditures are covered. You could lose a client or two and everybody's payroll still goes through. And you also have an idea of where you want to be and how you want to get there. That's a marketing strategy. That's a marketing plan. That's when you want to start looking at marketing. But if you need clients and you need them to make your monthly bills, you need business development. You need strategic partnerships. You need to learn how to cold call or warm call, change the conversation, prospect, because you're out there selling yourself and your bread and butter depend on it. So that is the question you need to ask yourself, Errol. Where were you strategizing to, for growth? We can't hear you, Steve. 
I wasn't talking to you. Sorry. Ah. Okay. Um, sorry about that. I got a distraction. Um, pronto. Your last sentence is what I missed. So was it a statement to me, the last thing that you said? I'm so sorry. He was asking if the marketing plan with Pronto is uh, is good. Josh, what's your experience with, uh, have, have you have any experience with the marketing plan with Pronto uh, in your past? Have you, have you used all of that? No, Pronto, but I don't use their marketing. I use Jane. Uh, well, I mean, are you, <laughs> I'm going to look and see exactly which, uh, which plan are you talking about the blog posts and the social media posts, Errol, or are you talking about something else? Um, so I have signed up for Pronto, the, the website building and hosting and all that. And I'm, and I'm going to be on the medium plan, the one that's $350. And I have, I've looked at all of the other services that they have available. And I can say that for an MSP, I would, I would likely ramp up into several of them. Uh, for MSP webinars, it's harder for me to justify a few of them because they are so focused on specific MSP type stuff. But, um, I'm I'm really looking forward to I'm really looking forward to figuring out uh, what all they have to offer, how how their service actually is. Um, there's there's one gentleman, his name is Alex. He was in here a couple of weeks ago for the um, monthly roundtable, and he had nothing but wonderful glowing reviews of Pronto, which is what prompted me to sign up for them because it, it just sounds fantastic. Um, so so that's kind of where I'm at when it comes to Pronto. <clears throat> well, it depends on what it is that you're looking for. See, a lot of people end up putting locking together a compilation of different things. Some people combine uh, Pronto with Facebook. Uh, with Facebook marketing, mm. it all depends on you know who their demographic is. So, for example, if you have a marketing budget and the majority of your clients have office managers and their demographic, your average office manager is a a female between the ages of thirty five and fifty four, then Facebook is the way to go because they're spending a lot of times trading pictures of grandkids and and cat memes, and Facebook's where they spend a ton of time. But if you are targeting a CEO, then, you know, you're going to want to do more, uh, more LinkedIn or uh, Google AdWords, uh, you know, building a presence like Pronto is going to provide you, you know, the, the blogging. But you have to keep in mind, it's not going to be CEO or it's not going to be SEO uh, scoring because that's syndicated content. So when you're looking at your strategy, you have to look at who is my customer and where do they spend their time? Um, so. I'm not familiar with the 800 and a month MSP plan, but I can take a look at it offline. Um, you know, it's, we can chat, um, but um, I don't really have an answer for you. But I know that I, one thing I like about Pronto is that they're responsive when you when you submit a request. They turn around fast and they do exactly what you need them to do. But you do have to keep in mind they are a bulk provider. They serve a ton of MSPs all over the place. And they all host in, you know, they all host everybody on the same IP. And, you know, that's something that you have to focus on. You have to think about that. So, you know, it's, it's really just kind of weighing your options and looking at who you're trying to reach and how you want to see results. And that's, and where you want to be in the journey. Uh, so if you want to pick up people in the decision phase, then, you know, you might want to go with, you know, more pay per click. You know, it all depends on what you're looking for. I wish I had a better answer. Sorry. Now, what I do find interesting is, you know, there's there's always, um, uh, again, m multiple 
ways of thinking about something. So, Jamie, you said there's no no such thing as a sales funnel. It's now a customer journey. Buyer's and, journey, yes. And, and to me, I mean, it just sounds like buzzword after buzzword. And a buyer's journey is the same darn thing as a, as a sales ah, funnel. It's not. The sales funnel, the sales funnel was uh, was was functional back whenever people used to go to a car dealership to learn about Ford. When the salesperson was the key, was was the keeper of all of the information, and you couldn't get you couldn't do your research from the privacy of your own home. Now people can do their research right there at the tip of their fingers. They can do it right from their phones, from their computers. They can even do it from their smart watches. If you want to find yes. out about a company, so. That's where the buyer's journey is. The journey where they decide they want to go and how fast they do it. So that's that, the- that's true. But I would say that it is still a sales funnel for us. No, we still not. have to take them through the the same process because they can't guide the process once they get to me. You have if- a funnel. They are not on a funnel. You want, to get them, you want them to go walk into your sales funnel, and that's right. just the way that you market, prospect, follow-up, cadence, calls. That's where things kind of – but the buyer gets plunked into it, and it's whether or not they're in their – you know, if they're in the awareness, the consideration, or the decision phase, where you pick them up and plunk them into your funnel. And that's where – you're going to get further. The clo- the earlier that you pick that buyer up and you plunk them in, the more likely you're going to control their decision-making process. And that is where there's no longer a one-size-fits-all funnel that a buyer has. A buyer doesn't pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm researching MSPs. No, they go online. They're going to look at this. They're going to read about that. They're going to read articles about, about one cry and fireball and the updates and da 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 They're going to read all that. And then they're going to say, oh, I have a problem. And they're going to look to the people who wrote those articles as their source, their trusted source to go, who should I go with? Those people are already going to get precedence when they're making that decision. And you want to be the person that is that voice. You want to be that first voice that's telling them they have a problem. And the only way that the smaller MSP can really control that is through active outreach. And that's why I don't believe in the cold call. I believe in the informed contact. You're reaching out to that customer to give them valuable information they may not know that they need, but you know it inside, outside, and it's it's a topic that you're comfortable talking about. And it puts them on your terms, on your turf, and builds trust from there. So that's where the buyer's journey and the funnel kind of meet. The funnel sits here. The buyer's journey is here. It's where they get plunked in is where you're in a competitive situation or you're the only people that they're considering or they're deciding whether or not they're going to fire their IT guy, their in-house IT guy, based on information you provide. It's all about where you pick that person up. Does that make sense? Um, someone, uh, it, it does. Someone asked if there's a way to rewatch this webinar. Yes, you can go to mspwebinars.com. I will have this webinar listed on the past webinars page. You can also go to MSP webinars on YouTube where you can see all of the webinars. Um, okay, it is, holy cow, it is 2.48, guys. Uh, it is it is time for us to wrap up. So with that said, um, if anyone wants to continue this conversation, there is a members-only Slack team that you can access by joining mspwebinars.com and and you you get access to the Slack team. It's right there in the members area. So we have daily peer sessions. It is a video audio chat where you are welcome to come in at any time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If someone else is in there on the video chat, then please feel free to join us. Um, so there's a button down in the bottom. Feel free to click that so you can join MSP webinars today. I will be in there in five minutes in the uh, in the peer session, and we'll just be talking about this and, and whatever else comes up. Um, Josh, Jamie, thank you so so much. Uh, you you two were able to provide so so much 
as as far as content and value to today's webinar. And I, I really appreciate both of you being here today. You both are welcome back anytime. Um, do you have any final words, wishes, anything for the for the people watching? Yes. Every time. Good luck to you all and uh, happy selling to everybody. And in the future, if you ever have trouble hearing webinars, check and disable autoplay extensions from your Chrome browser. Hmm. Disable autoplay. Oh, wow. I wouldn't you know, the extension that. that gets the YouTube videos to not play or the little ads to autoplay on your, on your web pages. I had that turned on. Apparently, that lets the web work, but not the audio. How weird is that? Lovely. So, uh, Jamie, real quick, can can you let people know if if they'd like to work with you for the marketing piece? Um, how can they how can they reach you? Uh, sure. I'm actually launching my website. Uh, it's uh, www.j is in Jamie. D is in Delta, like Dono. Uh, B is in Bravo. Bizdev.com. I'll put it here in the chat. Uh, but I'm going to be launching that. And Steve, I sent you a uh, a, a QR code if they want to sign up for a free consult. I don't just, um, I, I talk about business development. That's what I do best. I also do marketing as well, but it's important to understand the difference because they are not the same. It all depends on where you are in your growth as to whether or not what, what's best for you. But biz dev, uh, business development is going to help you be more effective at selling yourself, whereas marketing is going to be more effective in letting marketing help sell you. So um, again, that's www.jdbizdev.com. And uh, do you need me to send out the QR code or you got that covered, Steve? Um, I will send that out once I find it. <laughs> I think you said, okay. Um, if you want to just send it to me as a message, I will make sure that everyone gets access to that. So that way, you know, hopefully people can reach out to you. Um, Thanks so much, right. Jamie. Thank you. All right, everybody. I do hope you all have a great day. Again, uh, feel free to join MSP webinars. Join me in Slack. Have a great day. Next week, Wednesday, we have a special webinar with um, Slinger. And Slinger has a really neat integration for things like Autotask, ConnectWise, uh, WordPress, Slack. Um, it's, it's like Zapier, but for MSPs. If, if you want my opinion. So it'll let you take Autotask and uh, integrate it with Slack. It would help you migrate uh, some settings and information and things from uh, ConnectWise to Autotask or more likely Autotask to ConnectWise. Um, so check out that webinar. You can go to mspwebinars.com and you'll be able to get signed up for that. Um, Thursday next week, is MSP CFO. Holy cow, it's already the end of the month. MSP CFO is an integration specifically for ConnectWise. So if you want to determine if your clients' agreements, um, tech, uh, technicians are, are being as profitable as you expect them to be, then you might want to check out MSP CFO as an integration for your ConnectWise. Um, that's, that's what I've got coming on, coming up in the next week or so. Thanks so much, everybody. I do hope you all have a wonderful day and a wonderful week and I'll see you all soon. Have you been looking for a way to stay focused on your goals and grow your MSP? Accountability groups from Rocket MSP can help. We offer weekly accountability sessions that meet online with a group of your peers. Your success begins with accountability. Go to www.rocketmsp.io to join your accountability group today.